Okay, it looks like everybody is here. So I will open it up to Michael to get us started. Can everybody hear me? Let's see. A1. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. We, as some of you may know, we were scheduled to have a proper opening tonight here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but um, the governor and the Department of Health said, you know, you're going to wait two weeks before anything happens. So, so here we are, quick pivot, and I think this is going to be a great deal of fun. Um, we've got Rusty here with us and uh, gallery staff too. So there's Rusty waving. Maybe you could tell by that rusty hair. Okay, now I first saw Rusty's work about 15 years ago, and I still think I saw it at Art Chicago, although Rusty and I have never really actually been able to figure out how, how we cross paths. <laughs> um, but uh, cross paths we did, and mine stopped directly in front of a work of his from where I did not move, and I was completely struck by it. It appeared to be a woven photograph, and, and I was, to myself said what am i what am i looking at like i did i don't i didn't know even where to begin and so i i decided to say okay let's work backward from what i can understand about what i'm seeing i can understand technically what i'm looking at and i could see what looked like maybe the use of scissors a cutting um, blade of some kind but there were multiple photographs and they were cut into these strips and they were staggered in terms of how they were reconstructed in like a you know cubism 2.0 in that we were looking at and an object again from different perspectives on one plane um the photos i saw appeared to depict a flower but not in a like a one-to-one -one x to y axis kind of way where everything made sense the flower image itself was woven but each photo stripe was kind of offset and staggered so that the flower was iterative in a way that that there were multiple references to the flower itself yet assembled by the artist's hands into one piece of artwork and okay so that was a lot to think about and it still is it, so so i'm looking at the piece and thinking okay he will beyond the technique rusty made something truly beautiful he nailed the beauty of the particular flower that we were looking at. He nailed a new way of seeing and a new way of making using both technology and what I was thinking was old fashioned craft. Um, luckily for, for all of us, Rusty's work has continued to progress in a way that's less, it's really interesting, less about refining of a, on a technical level than about exploring and continuing to explore and to push and i i hope that makes sense because i really think that's key to what what rusty is up to rusty it's not like his lines are thinner or or, or better or more crisp it's the, the work is continuing to unfold as one one innovation leads on another innovation um rusty's work is now a lot less about photography than it was um his his constructions have a kind of a confidence in their DNA. Like the, they're literally made of building blocks and shapes that Rusty himself invented so that they could provide a structure for paint, uh, for knitting, and you know, in some cases in the past photography, this the lattice that all this work hangs on doesn't recede into the background, but it's very, very confident part of, of the work that Rusty is making. It's like, I was thinking like, what if you could see, if you were looking at the side of a car and you could see all the parts of it, like it was all right there, but there was the, the drivable car in, in all, of its, all of its glory. It's like you get to see the piece of art, but all the way through it. So our eponymous exhibition is called Cube Network based on these kinds of building blocks and this way of seeing that Rusty has developed. Um, thank you for hearing me out on that. Um, in terms of what's going to happen, Rusty's going to uh, talk a little bit over the next uh, slideshow that we're going to run. And we, um, 
gallery staff will ask Rusty some questions as we get excited about uh, things that come our way. You guys, if you want to submit questions, please do it in chat and we will look at that and we'll select some um, to ask after um, we run through the slideshow and then Rusty will uh, also give us a tour, a live tour in his studio up close and personal with some of the pieces. Um, we are also going to pin Rusty to the speaker view. You can go back to your gallery view if you want to see everyone like Hollywood Square style, um, but speaker view will have Rusty front and center. And, um, uh, and I should let all of you guys know that we are going to record this, so um, there you have it. Right now, I am very happy to introduce the artist himself, Rusty Scrooby. Can you hear me now? Can, can people hear me? A thumbs up? Yes, good. Um, so yeah, I'm Rusty Scrooby. I'm based here in Dallas, Texas, and I see some of my friends on here, so I know you know where I am exactly. Um, so to, to get to where I am, because this is a really new body of work, I, I've been knitting my whole life, but this is, Within the past few years, I've been experimenting with knitting, and this is the first body of work that I've made that it was really focused on knitting. But the way I got here, I, I started out, my first show was drawing and painting, and I'll, I'll move kind of quickly because I want to focus on the current work, but I started out drawing and painting, kind of photorealistic, but that turned into me curious about the abstract, I, I was more curious because of some music composition that I had been obsessed with and went to school for. I wanted to see visually how music could work. And so I started working with repetition and here in the piece you're looking at, it's called Blue Bucket and that's me as a kid. And I had worked with lots of uh, family photos. And, uh, but I was building a scale, uh, visual frequencies. And it was about music and it had to do with how much repetition and how abstracted and um, trying to understand that scale and how I could start building harmonies. And um, that, we could probably go on to the next image, I, I think, if it's, if it's 3D globes. Um, yeah, so that music and repetition made me think about exploring uh, that image through space because in my head that flat repetition it, it, it kind of like woven paper fabric um, it was spatial it, it looked 3d it looked like I was looking through water at an image it felt in my head it felt 3d and so I started exploring that scale and, and started moving my repetition through space so this was, this was actually three overlapping pieces, but each one has a certain projected direction that the image covers those globe forms. And um, that space was, those, those were so much fun to make, but so hard to, to transport and, and all that, that uh, I only did a few of those pieces before I started wanting to compress the space compress, uh, not take over rooms, but work within a limited area. And we could probably move on to the next uh, slide. But I, so like in, that's Radicchio here, that, um, that's about two inches deep, two and a half inches deep. And so I still, because of the way the pieces go together, there's still overlap and repetition, but it's just, it almost looks like a flat image, but of course, as you walk around it, and I, we probably will see some of that. Uh, I think we've got a video, but as you move around, it gets distorted because it's on a 3D surface. And I paint the pieces flat. I, I, I work up the image in the computer and figure out how each little section of each little plane is has to be stretched in certain directions so that when it goes from being flat on my easel that I'm painting to 3D, it, the image comes back into focus. And um, I, 
I love bringing it into my world that way. With all that focus on the geometry and stuff, I feel like I really possess the, the image that I, you know, I, I feel like it's a lifelong, I have captured that. Uh, so I'm very, I'm kind of greedy <laughs> about making these pieces lately because I, I just, it's so satisfying. Um, but anyway, that was, uh, that's Radicchio. And I was, a lot of the work here is based on fabric patterns and, and knitting patterns and a lot of stitching and fiber. And um, for years I had worked, like I said, with family photos, but some of these fabrics that I kept seeing also struck nerve and are part of my memory. And so a lot of the images that I have used are glimpses of what the, the closest to the memory that I can find. You know, I went, I searched through a bunch of image databases, looking for searches, trying to, trying to capture things from my memory. And um, I remember my mom wearing this, but oh, what is it? Jeffrey and I talked about this, damask, it's damask. <laughs> uh, she was wearing this damask dress and she was beautiful and she liked dressing up and she was probably 20 in college and uh, in front of these curtains, that just had a real striking black on white pattern and then her dress stood out, it was a damask. And uh, I kind of think that's why I've been drawn to some damask patterns lately. But um, anyway, we could probably move on to the next slide. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> so I worked in that narrow two and a half inch deep space. And then I wanted to expand it a little more. I mean, I, I'm really into this play between 2D and 3D. And this will sound weird, but what fits into my head? What the amount of space I can take in? And it, I don't know how to explain that. But um, it, this is modern Delft. I've always, just like Damask, I've had a, a thing for Delft. And uh, so these are just interlocking cubes. And um, I worked the, the image out across the space so sometimes the image reverses on the other side and um, really enjoyed leaving it unresolved. I usually have everything painted and but uh, this is kind of in a state of transformation and uh, Rusty can I ask you a question? This is Tanya. Yes please. Um, I find this piece particularly interesting because of the way that you have integrated the sense of engineering and mathematics, if you will, um, with visual art in the way that you've taken the, you've taken the complete image, which you kind of see at the top with all the layers on it, and then you've mm -hmm. deconstructed it down to its fundamental element which is the wood, the cube, a platonic perfect shape. And yeah. um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about your um, creative process in constructing this piece um, as far as how your training as an engineer um, and your incredible interest in musical composition and mathematics? informs your creation of this particular piece? Well, th this one definitely shows my love of engineering, but the, the combining with the, the damask pattern, I feel like I'm combining a very uh, structured, sometimes masculine aspect <laughs> with, uh, with a more organic, uh, image with curves and so I a lot of times I'm trying the, the painting is there to create the contrast and to either have the image subvert the shape or enhance the shape as I'll discuss a little bit with the knitting pieces and um, so but the geometry 
really actually comes a lot from knitting. And, and I was, I love engineering, I love math, but it really came from when I was little and how the, you're knitting and the strand of yarn goes back and forth and holds onto itself and creates this extended fabric and how that one pattern can be just turned into a pearl, turned into a yarn over, turned into things that uh, make this incredible complexity. And so my, I love things that can be described with a language like knitting, you know, K1, P2, T-O-G thing. A and it, it tells you what it's gonna become. And that's what music does and that's what math does. They have their abstract language that conveys something a lot more grand. And so my connection with music, um, it's a, <laughs> I could start rambling on this one because it's, it's a huge topic for me, but that's what carried me through my art for 20 years or so is trying to figure out how music expressed itself so exactly. I mean, you know when a piece of music is going to reach a climax or when it's reaching its, its final cadence and that you can, we just know certain harmonies and dissonances that give us cues. And um, so figuring out how to do that visually is what drove me through a lot of this work. Um, Rusty, the, yeah. would you mind, I'm gonna go ahead and advance forward to the next one because we do have a few of these pieces that are in the 3D yeah. sort of realm. Um, and if we wanna kind of talk about like these pieces and then um, I would love to move on from there to then yeah. the knitting. Yeah, I don't have like, quick answers for some of these. Yeah, no, it's totally <laughs> fine. Um, we yeah, can... and this is this is building a nest, and we uh, Hampton and I had a bird outside of our window that we watched the little baby grow up, and so that I I built this piece kind of thinking about you know a bird crawling through all the briars to have this little cave inside, to, and we got to watch it out of our bathroom window, and um, but this is a lot about when I was a kid. My mom had Chinese puzzle balls. It, it, they're, they're carved and you have those ring, concentric rings and you can turn them and having this, this image over a 3D structure, it, th that was one of my inspirations. This was soon after a visit home to my mom and uh, a little bit before she passed away and we had her items and I suddenly realized what had inspired one of my inspirations was those Chinese puzzle balls. And so I made this piece and I was looking at the bird and um, so it, uh, I love that piece. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic, it's a fantastic piece. Um, let's talk about this vintage grass piece. It's hanging behind Jeffrey in the gallery right now. Oops, sorry. Oh, oh back, ah, <laughs> here we go. Pardon me, everyone, my mouse was being very sensitive. One there, we go. yeah. Vintage grass is one that I, I think was a. We had a fabric pattern that was a pillow, and so I think that was a pillow on my couch. And uh, I don't have a long, long explanation other than trying to capture this memory of my my living room on the Quadrant where we used to live. Um, but it, it's called. Thank you. It's called um, vintage because I, I looked up Japanese vintage prints to find it. Oh, fantastic. So this is another piece where it illustrates how you um, have to, because when you look at this piece straight on, it look it, it renders correctly as if it were 2D, right? Um, so everyone and, in the audience can get an, an idea of how you had to, to take the image and take the planes of that 3D surface and make those two work together, right? So you have to Tell us a little bit more about that again. Well, yeah, and earlier I had talked about subverting the, the structure. So, so the actual white background, it, it's actually cream colored paper and I paint it white and then paint the blue on it and it's then white and blue trying to get the edges good and it takes a while. But um, I like that kind of meditation. On, and that blue surface uh, looks flat from the front and that, flattens the background, that subverts it, or at least in my thinking, that subverts the background. Whereas some pieces, and I'll show you later with the knitting, it enhances the, 
the different planes and the structures. It, it, it works with the geometry of the background. This one, I want the image to win out over the structure. Yeah, it's very cool. And it's very interesting how you have to manipulate that image to make it um, to, to make it subvert that structure. It's it's, it's a very interesting process. Yeah. So now let's, let's move on to um, can, can we just call that for just one second on that one on that piece? I, I find that one especially intriguing because there's such a sharp contrast between the organic uh, paint and the extremely geometric uh, three dimensional um, uh, kind of construct that that is placed on rusty are you painting that after the the construction is made no no and i wouldn't you know every now and then i want to touch something or adjust it after it's in its 3d form mm -hmm. and i can't control i can't control those edges on that 45 angle it sure. I, I it would i would have to develop that skill everything's flat I, I have eight and a half by 11 pages of drawing paper that I paint on. And I have, I've printed out the extents of my puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I know I cut it out with scissors and push pins and uh, I score it with a pen tool and I, I fold my shape up and then I get to see it, you know, it's already painted at that point. Right, right. I think it kind of goes back a little bit to Michael's initial reaction to when he encountered your work. And for me, this one is is especially um, a, a, a very fascinating puzzle for the mind when you start breaking down how you have um, created the piece and what your process was. So thank you for explaining that. Sure. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I grew up as an artist in a sense, say thirty years ago, with potters. I still have lots of potter friends, and the way they can set up their glazes and get it ready for firing, and then the magic happens. Then they get to see what happens at the end. And in a sense, I feel like I finally get to see the piece once a bulk of it is is gone together. I, that's what keeps me going, to because it takes months <laughs> to work on some of these. Sure. Thank so you. do we want to move on to the next one? Yeah, let's move on to the next one. This is an, yet another um, image put atop the 3D surface, and this time it's a little more figurative. Yeah, yeah, tree guide, and this is actually an embroidery pattern. And I, it, it's a template for a, a tree, and a template I was thinking is like a guide because it really felt like a person kind of walking with the curves and uh, something I might have a connection with. <laughs> so um, yeah, that that is a real small little meditative piece. Um, I'm kind of tempted to do the embroidery because I do I do a lot of hand stitching type of work, so that's likely to show up in something else. Great. So yeah, hey, and it's hard to tell, but those are green. It's green and black, and, and I couldn't quite capture a good image, but all the needles, I, I see them as pine needles, are mm -hmm. green. Um, a yes, little hard to capture. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to the knit pieces, because we actually have um, some people in the chat have asked some questions, and I think it'd be kind of interesting to address those while we talk about these, but let's just sort of, you know, really, yeah, let's, let's get let's, into like talking about these knit pieces and how about you start out and then we can sprinkle in the, the questions that I'm getting on the chat. Okay. Um, yeah. So I have been knitting since I was five or six years old. My, my grandma and my mom showed me and then for the past 10 years or so, YouTube, anytime I have a question, I've learned so much from YouTube. We do have some street noise every now and then. I don't know if you heard the motorcycle. Um, but so I've been knitting my whole life. And about 10, 12 years ago, I think the art world started embracing craft materials more. And I started seeing knitters and a whole spectrum of things. And I love that because I was a knitter, but I was working with photography and I didn't want to do something trendy. And over the years, it, it hasn't seemed trendy. It doesn't feel that way anymore. And I started thinking, well, why aren't I doing 
the thing that I love and really is a huge part of my life. So um, that's really what led me to, to do this much knitting. And um, this piece, if you, well, it'll be, I'll explain something when I have a piece in front of me. I'll take one off the wall and I'll explain a couple things. But this one is using sock yarn. So it was a real, uh, I've been knitting socks this past year in lockdown. And um, so this is, if anyone knows yarn, this is hand dyed yarn from Lolo Did It and Indie Dyer in Las Vegas. And so each of those colors, there's Rumpelstiltskin and Red Red Wine and uh, whole and Narnia, a whole bunch of colors, named colors in there. Um, These are wonderful. But this one, it, it does. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, the in color, the colors are so intense. I, I get excited getting a new skein of yarn, almost like someone gave me a huge jewel, or you know, here's a, a thousand carat sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> and I love yarn. I, going into a yarn store for me is dangerous, um, especially now that Hampton, my husband, uh, seems to like buying yarn too. So we're not good together that way. Oh dear, uh, I just, I keep looking at these pieces and that piece is, is one of the ones that's hanging behind you, um, the piece that we have on yeah. the screen now. And this, yeah. it just, it's so impressive to me how the, like the exact measurements and the, the exact amount of stitches and, and how you have to make that work on this very rigidly structured 3D form. Um, I just marvel at how, how you can do that. Is there, yeah, so yeah, give it, let's see, let me see if I can... Let me stop sharing my screen for a minute so you, you guys can oh. see Dusty. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I knit the front. I lace up the back. It's like little corsets. And I actually, I started a YouTube knitting channel and I've gotten a couple comments from some of the expert knitters on there. And uh, so there's a few people that have actually helped me with technique. Rob DeLine, if you're, you're out there, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, oh, okay. So is it, on, on that piece, the image, like on one, there's a bird called Companion. On, on this one, the image is triangles. And again, I'm trying to subvert the, the structure uh, because the triangles don't match up with, uh, the, the structure is like three interlocking networks. Like this tip, I don't know if this will make sense, but this tip connects to these tips this is all one connected network and then this tip connects to this connects to this that's a different network and there's three networks that interlock to get the, the overall filled in structure and um, here I want the image to look like triangles and uh, not some interwoven thing and if I had the lighting perfectly from the front, that image really pops out and kind of becomes triangles a lot more. So these change during the day too. Having these on your walls during strong light, uh, the structure gets emphasized during a weaker light where the, all the planes are the same, the image becomes more present. So there's this, it's a good play during the day. Uh, so that's triangles. Okay. All right. Well, let's go. I'll start sharing the screen again so we can go back and see nice close-ups. I think there was one before this. Let's just make sure. Yeah. Look at all these beautiful pieces. Um, we have got, let's go back to, okay. Yeah. I think that was the next one. Okay. Okay. Then companion. Yeah. So, Again, this and this is an in progress uh, image. I I ended up shipping this piece because of our our online uh, meeting. I shipped it and forgot to take a picture at the very end, so my fault. But so there's a couple tips. You see the wood underneath. I do this with a, a poplar wood construction first, 
and then I knit the covers and uh, I've worked out a bracketing system in the back to hold the three different networks together. Um, and so I disassemble it and assemble it again with the knitting and, uh, uh, and this one I named as Companion. We have friends in Santa Fe. Uh, and she has a platform she's built to feed birds. Uh, and is, is it an eagle? What? Not an eagle. It's a huge hawk, right? I think she's got a huge hawk that comes and it, she whistles or something and she can hear it screech from miles off and it comes and lands. And um, I've just been thinking about wild animals being, having all the emotions that we do. Just making a deep, rich connection with an am, animal. I, I take care of feral cats. I just recently read a, a, or watched a documentary on Netflix, uh, My Octopus Teacher. And that was beautiful connection with this wild animal. And uh, anyway, that's what I was thinking about when I named the piece. Fantastic. Um, well, cool. Well, let's go to the next one. And um, I wanted to just make sure we are addressing some questions in the chat. Um, Nancy asked, uh, why or when did you choose to include yarn? I know you kind of covered this, but I just want to make sure she gets her question really um, answered because she asked it, was it specifically just the connection to music or something else? Uh, it was something that I had been using since I was a little kid. So I've been knitting off and on since I was oh five or six and um it's been in the background uh, i would whenever it gets cold i start knitting but i'd say about five years well I, probably about eight years ago i started doing afghans and exploring different patterns and when the women's marches started happening uh it, about four years ago, I knit a bunch of hats for the for the women's marches, and I started exploring more, and that turned into me um, doing, wanting to do my art, wanting to just spend day after day knitting and have it be productive for my career and all that, and um, so I started becoming. Even though I've knit for 50 years, I became obsessed with it probably four or five years ago. Yeah, it's it's a way of painting. It, it's it, to me, I love creating image, and I have explored drawing and painting and um, playing cards and uh, other media to form pixelation and uh, uh, ways of creating imagery, and um, usually through units. And uh, knitting lends itself to repetition and slowly change, you just shift your pattern and you can work with the same kind of principles I've been doing with photography. So, um, plus I like making things more complicated for some reason. I just cannot, like, oh, I've got, I know exactly how to do this photography. Why not do something completely different and harder? So, you know. <laughs> hey, so Tanya, Tanya put her hand up, so I think she has something to, to ask you or to say. Hi, Should Rusty. Should we move on to the next piece, too, so we can maybe talk about? Yeah. Hi, Rusty. I, um, I, I think what you were saying about starting to knit during the Women's March is the perfect segue to something I've been thinking about um, regarding your work and the way you've introduced knitting into your work. So in the past, you had been working with different elements like paper um, and in some cases die cut plastic discs, if I'm correct. Am I correct about that? Well, actually, I have done die cutting with large photo pieces, but the plastic, like milk jugs, that was hand cut. Okay. So, yeah. so paper, plastic, and those two, and also then you moved on to wood, and, and those elements are, are very hard edge. They're very, um, they're known to be used for things that involve um, making structures, you know, yeah. or creating fabricated things that are removed from, 
in some degree, to large degree, from the human hand. As long as you're talking about wood that's constructed in, in a geometric way, as opposed to a sculpted, rounded way, right? Yeah. And so for me, personally, when you started introducing the element of yarn with your work, um, as a woman, I responded to the, uh, or the way it felt to me as a woman and an art historian, is that you were adding a sense of softness and warmth to your work. And I really appreciated that. Likewise, because of the, um, the Women's March and everything it represented after 2016, I, I felt that you were creating a perfect interface of masculine and feminine elements in your work and that you were doing something that, art, that many artists might yearn to do but few were able to achieve, which is uniting kind of the anima and the animus, the male and the female in art. And, um, and I'm so, that was just an intuition I had, but I'm so glad that you brought up that you started using yarn as an element after 2016. That's really meaningful. Yeah, well, thank you. I, if I would have been prepared, I could slip on a few hats. I've got one with a little Twitter, a 3D bird on it. It was taming yeah. the Twitter. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I liked hearing that you picked up on that because, I mean, I guess probably a lot of art is, is personal exploration and a lot, a lot of mine certainly is. And it's kind of trying to resolve my mom and my dad, different parts of myself. And uh, my dad was a math teacher. My mom was a music performer, grade school teacher. And so very different ends. And um, I do feel like I'm trying to, to bridge things and, and unite things, not, not just juxtapose, have them together, but I'm trying to, to meld uh, something. That, so I, that was really nice to hear because I do think about that. Uh, uh, and that's, I guess, a lot of the fabric patterns are stereotypically more women, but um, I am excited. Uh, there are a lot of male knitters. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a family where the men knit. Uh, my grandpa tatted, you know, little shuttle to make lace work. Uh, he tatted and my dad had learned how to knit in World War II. I guess it was kind of standard. Uh, to learn that skill and um, kind of gave me permission and uh, so now but now there's lots of knitters I think there's something about lockdowns that lots of people are baking sourdough bread and knitting knitting hats <laughs> socks <laughs> it's interesting it's like there's an impulse a human impulse to do the things that um, that make us feel connected with each other and yeah. I think on a subconscious level, you have, you've ex you're expressing something in these works that we all yearn for. And it's like a uniting on, and an embracing of the things that connect us all and add comfort. Thank you. Well, it def it, it's satisfying for me. So um, that's good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So in fact, when we were talking about the masculine energy, this piece uh, titled Intensity seems to have quite a masculine energy to me. Um, you have it hanging behind you as well. Would you mind showing everyone? I'll stop sharing my screen so you can get a little more active in the... Um, in yeah, the I'll see here. how. And I'll, yeah, and this one, uh, I you said it's a little more masculine and I the the pattern emphasizes the structure. So I'm, it's not stripes or triangles where the, the pattern subverts, but this one intensifies, hence the name, intensive. You're right, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic piece. And can you right. kind of show us around that? I don't know how, I, I can't quite keep track of, because I'm looking at a thumbnail, so I don't know how, wait, which way do I go? can. Again, it's just laced and brackets and wood. Very cool. Okay. 
Rusty, it's amazing to look at the back of that piece. And in a way, I get a kind of a tingle, you know, as a guy, I'm like, ooh, look at all the hardware. And look at the, you know, when I, when you can see like the guts of the thing, like I was saying about like, imagine seeing a car all, with all of its parts and, you know, and being able to look through it. it was, <laughs> and that's why these layers, the networks are, can't, there's space in between. So you're, you're looking through the gaps and some of the, the painted paper ones I do, it's all flush and, and it makes a more solid surface like that's Radicchio, that red and white one. Yeah. But these, you see through it, you see the gaps in between and yeah, yeah. I like that part. I'd love to do a whole wall, and, but. Uh, right from just the other way around. Um, yeah. at, at the risk of being daft, so are they, are the 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 wooden the cube network pieces are milled and made right and then are those knitted on and then they're assembled uh yeah i make so here let me let me grab a new one so can you see me so each one of these tips is like a tripod if you see how they're it's kind of like tripods that slip next to each other and so I build, I cut the legs, I assemble the tripods, I assemble the tripods into units, um, and I know which shapes to, I make three different units, three different shapes that I know will fit together then like a jigsaw puzzle. And once they're all fit together, I put brackets on them so that I know how to assemble them that way and Deassemble them, is that a word? But anyway, I know how to go back and forth. And um, and then, I, so the knitting, so the wood is done separate. And I knit the wood, uh, the, the yarn, as I'm doing the wood. I mean, I, I kind of am going back and forth, but the, the wood's done separately. I, I guess I don't know how to but answer like, your question. Like, are they, are, 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 are the coverings for the tripods done almost like little socks and then fit to the fit to the they wood? Are, yeah, they I'm knitting chevron shapes that uh, like a bunch of joints chevron shapes. Okay. Uh, that I seam up in places so they form like 3D tents, 3D that fit the exact shape. So it's not like I'm stretching it like a, shop, a sock with ease that that expands or contracts. So it's it fits the shape, right? But, but, then, but yeah, but the but the idea of like, you are making a kind of like a little art sock, right? And, and it's yes, a, yeah. it's using fingering weight. It's using sock yarn. Yeah, yeah and it will ultimately go over the foot or the or the tripod. Oh my! Yeah, I, I don't know how closely can see it, but probably not. But I didn't get that. Very, I love it. Very detailed. Very very detailed. And I want if I had had more time, I wanted to make socks to match these. So it's like if someone buys a piece of art, they get a pair of socks with the same yarn and make stripes with it. That's a fantastic oh. idea. Oh, do oh. it! Do it! Oh my gosh, that is so fabulous. That is so fabulous. Any triangles in it? Uh, no, no. Yeah, I don't think I do. Well, I'm sure I, if I rummaged around, I could find little examples of uncovered things, but I don't know if you want me disappearing for a few minutes. <laughs> No, we're good. Um, so if you want, you want to go back to, I mean, yes, maybe Hampton can find them and share them with us. It'd be super awesome to see. It's almost like, it's like how you have that piece with the wood pieces hanging out and they're naked, you know, and they just don't have their sock yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I love I that. I love parts. that. I get all the parts and then I seam all the parts together. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's kind of this unwieldy thing for a while until it starts getting and laced up. And yeah, like a, like I said, it's like a corset. It just like sh 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 and tighten it yeah. up, and off she goes, you know. <laughs> and it, it, that, that part's real satisfying because after the the weeks, then all of a sudden it starts getting pulled into place, and I get to start seeing how the stripes or the imagery comes together, and yeah, very fun for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Did we want to go back to look at a slide, or do we do, do we also? I mean, Jeffrey has pieces behind him in the gallery, maybe. 
if people are, would like to see, I think the, the 3D is really fun to explore with these pieces because the straight on image um, translates a piece in just one way. Um, so I don't know, Jeffrey, if you would, wouldn't mind um, pulling a piece for us to look at, like maybe stripes that's behind you. I will ask you to unmute. Yeah. Oh, and then we have Rusty. Okay. Yeah. And we have Rusty with the with the three D sculpture, more like all side sculpture pieces behind you there, and then which I talked yeah. about in the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if everybody gets a chance to look at those, and then we'll have Jeffrey talk about the knit piece in a second here. But let's look. You know, if everyone gets a chance to see these guys and how they project from the wall, how they interact with the space around them. It's kind of interesting. Um, if, do you have the modern Delft? Could you sort of um, pivot it around for us a little bit? Well, I think I can move this camera a little bit. I wonder if, if I can get close enough. Oh, yeah. That's great. And we can just kind of. Yeah, so this was a woodworking challenge, to say the least. Oh, I can't quite. I don't really have visibility to know what I'm doing. <laughs> it looks great. It's really nice to get up and see that detail and get a different shot of it and how, uh, how you can experience it if, if we were to be in person. Yeah, again, the Chinese puzzle ball kind of mm -hmm. uh, enjoyment for me. Yeah. Cool. I loved the description that you had for this piece, building a nest, when you were talking about how um, a bird would kind of climb through all the briars and, and it's almost about obstacles and struggles and how um, they can be overcome. It's sort of yeah. a bit of a life and yeah, those, that piece. Those, uh, those uh, fragile, tender little babies with our feral cats and hawks and everything around are um, kind of safe in those briars and they know the paths to get in and out. And, uh, and that's radicchio, that damask pattern. Rusty, you Let said me know if you that that really um, that really struck me earlier when we were talking about the the rather more rigid geometries against the the curves of a damask pattern or a grass or a path, and and I I didn't I hadn't really seen that in your work until until you mentioned that, and it is. It is so completely delicious, and it was funny because you were used the word subvert, which is a real. It's an intellectual way of, of, of you know, thinking about these things, and of course, you know, contemporary art is full of these great intellectual traps that are, you know, brainy as opposed to being aesthetic. And um, I mean, maybe that's why I didn't see it until until you mentioned it. But I abs I'm absolutely enamored of the idea, and Tani hit on this too. Of the idea of this the curves against the rigid and it seems so much in in a way you know like less philosophical than just delicious and, and i had alluded to before in terms of your exploration like that's your that's your line it's not like making a line straighter or thinner so, but but it's rolling into these fabulous fabulous places where round crashes into crashes into square but it's not a crash at all it's it's because you've got the artist's hand it's there's this loving thing that that's really what what i see anyway as the viewer that you've managed to pull off with like it's like watching a really great tennis player you know there's so much art and the stroke you're not even looking at all the you know all the all the the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that went into you know, went into that moment because the ease of the final product is so is so delicious. And this is le less a question than a statement, but I'm, 
Um, I, I'm just, I'm always so enamored of what it is that you do. It's, it is such a, such an incredible treat to, to hear you talk and to, and to be able to see the work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say, but I, I'm a little embarrassed, but that's, that's awesome. I love hearing it. <laughs> I'm not too far off, am I? Like, I'm, I'm in the range of being, does that sound right? It, that leads me in a lot of my work. Yeah, that is a common thread. And it, it's really until the past 10 years or so, I didn't think of it as, I thought of music leading me and the intellectual pursuits. But it's really, there's a lot of self-exploration and understanding my parents. And it's just very, a lot of my work's really personal, even if it uh, looks geometric and uh, yeah, yeah. So. I identify with what you said. <laughs> it's like, well, and it's, for an artist, it's like a writer. You you write about what you know about, right? So an artist, I think it has to be personal in order for it to yeah. be meaningful and to translate and to have other people find it meaningful and engaging. Um, so we have a little, I want to show everyone, apparently in the chat, we see that Miss Nancy I'm gonna spotlight her video here for a second because she has one of your hats that you made. And <laughs> oh, purple pussies! <laughs> so all my all my pussy hats have pink on the top edge because from overhead I wanted the pictures to help reinforce the, all the pink, the the seas of pink. Ah, oh, Nancy, hi. Yeah. Oh, shit. Oh. And Nancy, go ahead and unmute yourself. She can't hear, Marcy. But anyway, I love it. she can hear you. I made about 40, I actually made 44 hats, and I got stuck. And I don't want to get into politics, but I got stuck on number 45. <laughs> and um, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty great. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your hat with us. <clears throat> Wonderful. Rusty's beautiful job and very thoughtful in, in keeping that pink on the top. Um, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I thank can't you. wait till we can eat out again, Nancy. What? I can't wait till we can eat out again together. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, well, thank you, you know, Nancy. Yeah. What? Thank you. Yes, you're yeah, welcome. thanks. I wanted to ask I love it. Rusty. I wanted to ask Rusty if you can just skip 45 and make a 46. <laughs> I yeah, yeah. Or I, would you I'm toying with that idea. making a really bad 45 and burning it and then making a 46? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an okay, orange yeah. 45. <laughs> Some kind of statement. <laughs> I, I've been thinking about yeah. it, and as as um, <sighs> hopefully soon I'll be able to breathe more and assess the damage. <laughs> I have one more question while I'm unmuted, and before people can like permanently mute me. Um, so <laughs> my I just kind of have been going farther with this idea of the knitting as far as wrapping the masculine geometric shapes in in the knitted soft. Um, yarn and then i also am noticing that even with the paper pieces you know they do have that um they oh wow i'm knitting a shawl now oh wow so my spare time i'm i'm doing some garments and all that oh thing. wow but even with the paper the patterns on the paper that you say were inspired by your mother's dresses um yeah even they are again asserting the combination of the feminine and the masculine. And yeah. I hadn't thought of that until you mentioned today on this Zoom that they are inspired by the patterns of her dresses and also the fact that your father was a mathematician and your mother was a musician. I hadn't put any of that together in this work but it really does make me see this particular body of your work as an incredibly mature evolution of what you've always been exploring in your work. And yeah, um, the knitting feels very, 
like I've taken a big step. It, it feels very, um, uh, like I've been heading this way for a while and it just feels very uh, comforting finally to get here. Yeah, and I know that before we were talking about your work as, you know, the knitting as sort of an encasement of the geometric object as if, and you pointed out that it doesn't stretch over it, but it's actually made independently to be an equal combination with it. Right. Yeah, I, I knit and I want to control the image. I want to, I, I know the gauge I'm going to get with each yarn I use and I know how big the stitch is going to be. And so I, I create a pixelated image. So, and so I'm not trying to approximate the shape and stretch it. I'm trying to recreate exactly the shape that I'm covering. And that's a perfect metaphor for what's going on in our society right now. For instance, it's not that we're trying to stretch another group of people, like as a race or a gender, to, um, to accept and mold ourselves around the masculine structure that's always been there or that's been in control for so long. It's that we're creating an equal and um, an equal but independent and independently authentic identity that can coexist um, exactly with the structure that's always been there. Yeah, yeah. And it really, I, I had not noticed it until recently. I've been talking about that uh, merging uh, in the last couple statements. I've been thinking about that more. Uh, merging of my parents, masculine, feminine, kind of nature versus man-made. There's a, a few ways I've played with it, but I think it all, it, one of the most fundamental aspects is my parents, is my psychology. Uh, and uh, yeah. when I was in, um, when I was at university, one of the areas of research, and we've never talked about this, but one of the areas of research for me was um, the idea of the, the anima and the animus that every single human being has a masculine and a feminine part of their psyche. And our whole um, journey in, uh, you know, in life is to reconcile and integrate the, the two aspects of ourselves psychologically. And that's why for me, this, this body of work that you're doing is so fascinating because you're, you're somehow finding that even if you haven't, sort of explored that academic concept, you are you're yeah. doing that integration subconsciously in yourself. Well, I do, I get drawn to that, finding resolutions between, between those two halves. Uh, I, I, I might have been a little bit of the peacemaker of the family. <laughs> Uh, cool. So um, I'm still still working it out. It's, it, it's satisfying for me to to uh, I don't know. I, I I I almost don't want to know exactly why I'm doing work, and it's great for an art talk. But there's part of me that doesn't want to finally figure out why I'm doing things because that's what keeps drawing me along. These pieces do take so many hours, but I'm really pulled through them because I have to see it. I have to feel the result, I, um, I see if it matches up to what's in my head. And so I don't want to know exactly why I'm doing all of this. I, I know people want to know why, but um, I also that, like figuring it out. Yeah, and that's, that's the interesting sort of function as the art of the artist in the world you know, um, is that the artist creates, the artist is like the philosopher that somehow puts things into the world, right? And then you have the, um, the part of society that functions to analyze the artwork, like the curators or the critics. And then you have the people like me and like many of the rest of us on this call who, who, you know, in a way, um, bring the artwork to life only in their own mind, 
so that the way the impression the artwork makes on the people that are experiencing it is their own creative um, impulse. It comes to life because you've given your half by creating it and putting it into the world. And then for the people that, experiencing, or that are experiencing it, they are, um, their mind is opened up by the thing you have created in an intermediary zone to ignite something entirely personal and different for every single person. Well, that you, you made me think of something by a, a lot of my earlier photographic work is, is very esoteric. And it, like I said, I think of it as this 3D kind of effect. Um, but people look at a photo of that work and it's hard to appreciate the detail, the, the, the scale and things like that. However, when I start working with these, with the knitting and the 3D sculptures, I think people can identify. People have all had a sweater on. They all know what that feels like. And so there's something that uh, lets people see it and experience it a little easier, I think, than my photographic work. Um, so that's been interesting hearing people's uh, getting into it. <laughs> uh, that's satisfying. Hey, guys, I, I love the idea of wrapping up now on a mystery and that the act the human act of creation and the human act of adoring and observing are not things that can can be quantified in i love talking around it but i think this is a this is a really really lovely place to to say there's there's beauty of foot at the hands of our our dear friend rusty who's made these incredible pieces and to walk with some of the love and the mystery that that uh, that you got to lay on us. So, thank you, buddy. Thank you, and everyone can see Hampton with me, hopefully. <laughs> hey, Hampton. <laughs> thank you, Hampton. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thank guys. You. Thank you, everyone. He puts up. He puts up with the whirlwind of creativity and stress <laughs> sometimes. <Yeah. laughs> Th thanks to everybody for joining us. It, this was really this felt like a really kind of a beautiful, a beautiful moment. And I, yeah, this is this is a good. It's satisfying. We we couldn't have the show we wanted, but th there's something really nice about this. So that's good. Something really really good. Well, Rusty, thank you so much, buddy. And and you know, as everybody should know, the work you know the work is in the gallery. It's at Rusty Studio. Some of it. It is all you know, available to be bought and collected and loved and adored. So if there's if there's something that really, really touched your heart, please give us a ring and we'll complete the circle. And you can touch knitting where you can't touch photographs. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. We love you and we thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank Good you, night. everyone. Thanks for coming. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Darling. <laughs>